What's up, TikTok? Looks like I'm back for my 10th stream. Again, if you miss any streams, or if you want to watch it again, all my TikTok streams are reposted over on my YouTube channel. Today I have an actual uh, purpose for the stream. Rather than just coming on here and thinking that people are going to ask me questions, which no one really does ever ask me questions, I came with a topic to talk about a topic. And because this is a grammar channel and I do teach a very specific type of grammar, I'm going to be talking about communication. And I'm going to talk about what I call pre-qualifiers. What I mean by pre-qualifiers is when, when you're having a conversation with somebody and they pre-qualify what they're about to say to you with some sort of remark. You see this all the time in social media. Like, for example, the first one I'll get to is uh, the meme that you see. And I think it comes from the film The Matrix. When one of the characters says, what if I told you, blah, 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 blah. What if I told you? <laughs> is, if you really think about it, is that not one of the goofiest things you've ever heard? It's like saying, what if I told you the road was paved? What if I told you the government wasn't your friend? What if I told you correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar can stop bureaucratic trespass? What if I told you the sun will come up in the morning? It's goofy. It, it's, it's just another example of how grammar and communication is used in a totally useless way. Well, maybe some people can find some use in it. But for me, it's goofy to say that. What if I told you trees had leaves? Well, what if? Who cares? <laughs> All right, so that's what a pre-qualifier is. You're like setting up, you're setting the stage for what you're about to say to someone else. One of my favorites is when someone will say something like, uh, well, to be honest, I really don't like that restaurant. Well, to be honest, I really don't like that restaurant. So think about it. What is the individual really conveying here? To be honest, does that mean that they're lying the rest of the time? So when they say, to be honest, now they're finally being honest, right? Think about how goofy that is. If I'm to be totally honest, I don't like that restaurant. To be totally honest, as opposed to all the other times when I'm not 100% honest, I might be 99% honest, but this time I'm being totally honest. How goofy is that? It's really funny to me. Here, here's a good one. I mean no disrespect, but we're on an airplane and your child is crying really loud. You need to shut it up. I mean no disrespect, but your ugly face offends me. You get my point? When someone says, I mean no dis disrespect, and then what do they do? They go on to disrespect you. <laughs> or the other one is, with all due respect, you're a jerk. When someone says, with all due respect. So they're basically telling you, they're giving you respect, but then they're about to disrespect you. 
be pretty funny. Looks like we got a comment here. Let me see. Uh, I missed your July class, but would still be interested in learning. Sean Pace. Well, Sean Pace, you can go to my bio and you will find an email address there, jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com. You can contact me and apply for workshops. I've been teaching this. I've been teaching workshops to hundreds of people all over the earth since February of 2018. So if you're serious about the grammar and you want to learn it, just contact me. Please include your full correct name at the bottom of your email so that I know who you are. Um, you know my full correct name. I just ask the same consideration of you. And also, you know, I, there are over 800 videos on my YouTube channel. You're more than welcome to spend some time over there studying. It's the sum total of my correct sentence structure knowledge. Thank you for the comment. Okay, so the next uh, pre-qualifier we're going to look at is when someone says something along the lines of, for real though, those pork rinds are delicious. Or, uh, no cap, man. This is a great sandwich. Like when you say, for real, though, like as if all the other times you're speaking and you don't say for real, it's not real. See how goofy that sounds? Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to make fun of anybody here. I'm making fun of the language we all use because I do these things, too. It's almost, it's almost unavoidable, just the way it's programmed into us. Everybody does it. I cannot think of one individual that doesn't use some of these sayings. But they're so funny if you really think about it, how goofy they are. For real, though, man. I'm really disappointed that Dodge isn't going to make eight-cylinder Mopars anymore after 2023. For real. As opposed to all the other times I'm talking about it and I'm not being real. <laughs> Or the other pre-qualifier about how you get someone to trust you or something, you will say, uh, you, you're really going to want to go to this rest restaurant. Trust me. Like that adds weight to what you're saying. Trust me. You don't know me, but you can trust me that this restaurant is really good. Go ahead and go there. You don't want to walk down that street at night. Believe you me. Someone says, believe you me. I guess it's uh, a phrase that someone uses that wants you to, is trying to convince you of something. Another good one is when someone says something derogatory or insulting to you, as if saying, just saying, sort of cushions the insult. When someone says something insulting, just saying, just telling the truth. And that's how I've taught in the past. You know, the truth is the truth, right? Facts are facts. Just like anything else, they can't hurt or help anyone. It's up to each individual as to how they use the facts and how they receive the facts. And it's like guns, you know, guns don't kill people. People kill people. Guns are just in instruments, conduits, just like words. They can be a weapon. The truth can be a weapon. You can tell the truth and really psychologically harm someone if you want to. You know what I'm talking about. The truth can be used as a club to really injure someone. And that is not correct volition, to use the truth to hurt someone. I'm not saying lie. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that the truth, when used in a certain way, can really hurt someone. And in that scenario, when 
a lot of times you'll you'll witness someone saying that to someone else. They'll say, uh, "Wow, you put on quite a few pounds." Just saying, as if the just saying excuses the person from the scenario. You know, it's hilarious. Yeah, Polk Savage, I say stuff like that too. It's almost unconscious. It's like built into us. We say it, everybody says it. I'm just trying to point out how funny it is. To me, it's funny. The prefix of a word beginning with a, dis, un, non, no, or all negative. Is there more? Oh, there's lots more. I'd say over 50% of the words you use have negative particles in them. Uh, a good rule of thumb to follow, and you can certify this by going to my YouTube channel or looking all the words up in an etymology dictionary. Any word that begins with a vowel followed by a consonant at the beginning of the word, any word that begins with a vowel followed by a consonant is no contract. That vowel is a particle of negation. Now, of course, there are other prefixes, like you mentioned, dis, un, non, no, pre, pro, sub, all kinds of them. You just have to look them up and do the legwork. You look them up in an etymology dictionary, you find out how many syllables are in the word, you look up each syllable, and when you look up that syllable in the etymology dictionary, that word particle, if you see some sort of negation or inference of negation in the meaning, the nativity root meaning, then that is indeed a negative particle. Another one that's not really a pre-qualifier, but it's it can get annoying sometimes to some people is when someone's having a conversation and I call it ingratiation. Like they're trying to get you to join in their little circle and get on the same page as them. They'll say, you know, I was going down the street the other day and uh, man, Johnny just, is a terrible drunk. Like he can't even walk a straight line. You know what I mean? Like he can't even talk without slurring his words. You know what I mean? Um, like when someone keeps saying, you know what I mean? 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 It's like, they're trying to draw you in to get you on the same page as them. That That's not a funny one, but it's just a, an interesting one. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? I'm sure everybody out there knows a person who does that. Now, one that really, I really have to try hard not to uh, get my dander up is when someone says something like this. Hey, can you get that cup for me? Please and thank you. Please and thank you. How presumptuous is that? Please and thank you. It's one thing to say please. That's being polite. But when you say thank you before the favor that is asked has been done, has been completed, if you say thank you before that happens, that's pretty damn presumptuous. You're assuming they're going to you're presuming that they're going to do what you what you're asking them to do. That's hilarious to me. Yes, uh could you please shut your mouth or could you shut your mouth please and thank you. <laughs> Ugh. That's one of the ones that gets me, you know. When someone says please and thank you, that that's like a Don't go there. Is there a rule such as in math, positive times positive is positive, positive times negative is? I guess you must have ran out of space there. You can say thank you even if someone doesn't do what you ask. What are you thanking them for then? If they don't do what you ask, 
Are you thanking them for not doing it? I'm not sure I quite understand your question, Sean Pace. Is there a rule? Positive times positive. But when there's an analogy that, like in a multiplication problem, you can have 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7 times 8 times 9. And if you put a zero in there, it zeroes the entire thing out. There's an analogy like that, but it's not a rule. It's an analogy. When we use this grammar, if you're using, if there's modifiers in your grammar, then that acts as the zero in the example I just shared with you. It, it zeroes out the whole thing. That's an analogy, though. That's not a rule. Volition is the most important thing. Grammar is the second most important thing. Hundred and twenty-three likes. Wow. Thank you very much. Maybe just for them taking the time to listen. Sure. If you mean it. There's nothing quite as positive as someone giving a genuine conveyance of gratitude. There's no doubt about it. I want to see how many people have viewed this thing. Oh, wow. 304 views. Thank you. That's awesome. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. That's about average for me. And that's really awesome. I appreciate everybody being here liking the stream. Go ahead and like the stream, please and thank you. <laughs> if anybody has any questions, like, you know, thank you, Sean Pace, for the questions. I appreciate that. Um, asking questions. Get the dialogue rolling. Um, I will be doing other seminars coming up here. I'm working on putting one together for the Live Life claim. I'm going to do a, a seminar on how people can create their own correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar claim of the Live Life. I'm going to explain all the mechanics behind it, the postal mechanics, the flag mechanics, the banking mechanics, of course, the grammar mechanics, uh, so that when you finish that class, if you have closure on the grammar, you'll be able to create your own claim of the live life. That's the next one I'm planning on doing. And then after that, I'm going to do a parse um, seminar where I'm going to show people the exact methodology that I use to parse words. And then after that, I'm going to do a syntax playlist. Um, not playlist, a syntax seminar where I go through all the steps of how to syntax. Why is acquiescence a rule? It seems that it's used to do dominate. It seems that its use dominates, dominance the ignorance. Sorry, having trouble reading here. I don't know quite what you mean, Sean Pace, by acquiesce. Why is acquiescence a rule? I'm not aware of any acquiescence rule. When I'm looking at the word acquiescence, I see a vowel in front of a consonant, which means no. So what does acquiescence mean, actually? Do you know what it means? And, and, and I don't mean in a sense of, like, we can think about the word acquiescence, and it just means what? It means you consent, right? That, that could be a synonym for it. But do you know what it really means? Have you ever looked it up? in an etymology dictionary and looked at the earliest nativity root meanings of the particles. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to actually punch it in and look it up and go through it. The beautiful thing about correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, for me, is that it has nothing to do with law or legalities. It is outside of that bullshit system. I don't even use those words in my correct sentence structure contracts. So acquiescence has four syllables, A, C, Q, U, I, E, S, C, E, N, C, E. So the next thing you would do would go to etymology online or whatever your favorite 
etymology dictionary is and look it up. Acquiescence comes from the 1630s, rest, quiet, satisfaction, to yield or agree to. So then we would go to the shortened word acquiesce from 1610, which means remain at rest from AD, which means to. So that's the first element of the word there, Sean Pace. The AC comes from Proto-Indo-European root AD, which means to, near, and at. And that is a particle of negation because, as I just said, it means to, near, T-O-N-E-A-R. It's not the thing. It's to the thing. It's going to the thing, or it's near the thing. It's not the thing itself. It's near the thing. That's why it's a particle of negation. And if it's going to the thing, then it's future tense. And any word that negates the now space is a particle of negation. So that is why that first particle is a no. So the next part is Q-U-I means become quiet from Proto-Indo-European root K-W-E-I upside down E, which means to rest, be quiet. So the first, so acquiesce basically means a contract with not being quiet. So I, I would never use that word. And as far as I know, acquiescence is not a rule. If you can point me to a link as to the context of what acquiescence is. Now, I've heard of things such as tacit agreement, and that's a rule in the fiction legal system where the court or a court, one of those foreign vessels in dry dock, may summon you to come to their location for a judgment and you don't show up, then that's tacit agreement. Meaning if you don't show up, if you don't even come there, you don't respond or anything, then you're just going to do what they're going to do. And you just have no say in the matter. That's how that works. Now, when I use correct set and structure, document, contract, postal vessel court venues, I will use a similar mechanic where I will put a timeline, I will put a drogue on it, and I'll say something like, to translate into plain, simple English, I'll give them a buoy. I'll give them some buoys. I'll say, if you don't, if I don't hear back from you in two weeks, then my claim has standing and we're done. It could be two weeks. It could be three days. It could be 90 days. It could be 45 days. It could be a year and a day if it's a salvage claim. It just depends. But that's pretty much across the board in the fiction and the fact. Tacit. In the fact, it would be called tacit hyphen joinder. Meaning if you remain silent, don't respond, ignore it, don't show up. Well, then people are going to decide things for you. Well, the matter is going to be decided for you. Um, during the last year of his life, the publisher of Correct Set and Structure Communication Parsi Syntax Grammar, Colin David Eifenwin, Colin Miller, who, who, by the way, published this grammar technology to the public in 1988. Uh, one of the conversations we had, he suggested never, um, never say no to a Vasily. And the reason being that you know why you wouldn't refuse something is because that creates 
it could create a potential um, a potential for use of force. And the fiction uses force. With correct sentence structure, you don't force someone to do something against their will. Unless they're attacking you, then you can use all the force you want to force them to stop. But you can't force someone to do something they don't want to do. The fiction does that. So what he told me was, never refuse to do something. Just say that you want to do it with correctness. You want to do it, but you want to do it right. So yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I just want to do it right. It's a very subtle psychological condition of state to do that. And it takes a lot of intestinal fortitude to be able to pull that card out when you're in the heat of battle. I did not know anything like this was available. Can I sign up for your seminar? Dozer 533. Well, when I get it, uh, when I get a date ready and everything, I will release information here on TikTok. If you subscribe, uh, you will see information about it. But in lieu of that, I do give uh, confidential workshops. I've been teaching this grammar since February of 2018. If you want to apply for a correct sentence structure workshop, just go to my bio and click on my email link. You will see my email address, jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com and send me an email and just say, hey, Jason, you know, I saw your TikTok stream. I would like to apply for your workshops and please use your full correct name. I ask that of you because you know my full correct name, Jason Knight from Matthew Cullen Glass. I just ask the same consideration of you. Just use your full correct name, not just your first name, your full name. Write me an email, apply for the workshop, and I'll get back to you within 72 hours. And we'll set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation. I'll provide the venue and then you can ask me whatever you want. And... I'll do the same and you'll get more information there. Jason Matthew G17 at gmail.com. Sean Pace, thank you very much for your participation. I appreciate the questions and everything. Um, salute, man. Shoot me an email if you want to do a workshop. Thank you for the gift. I appreciate that. I appreciate anyone who finds value in what I'm sharing. And again, folks, I mean, there is a lot of content on this particular TikTok page, which are basically just short segments taken from my YouTube videos. There are over 800 videos on my YouTube channel, www.youtube.com forward slash Jason Matthew Glass, link in the bio, of course, all kinds of stuff about correct sentence structure. If you want to learn it, you can go over there. You could actually learn the entirety of, of quantum grammar over on my YouTube channel. It just takes a lot of time, a lot of investment, a lot of commitment. When I was first learning this stuff back in 2017, I would take uh, Colin David Eiffel, Wynn, Colin Miller seminars and uh, the director's party with him and Colin Russell, Heaven J. Colin Gould, and I would transship them over into MP3 format and I would put my earbuds in and no matter what I was doing, if I was working or doing stuff around the house, I'd be listening and listening and listening to those seminars repeatedly over and over and over all day long. That's kind of how it goes, you know, most people will tell you that, and that's how it went for me, is this stuff, you don't get it like that. It kind of has to permeate your psyche, and it takes a long time and many repeated listenings. I've watched a few of your YouTube videos. Well, thank you very much for your viewership. In the spirit of what we started off this live stream, the topic we started off with, when someone says a few, what do they mean by that? Like we know what a couple is. A couple is two. But what's a few? I've always thought that a few was like three or four. But some people, it's not three or four. Some, some people, it's more than that. Which brings me to some other anomalies in the English language. 
that are very, very funny. When you say you have a pair of socks, how many socks do you have in a pair of socks? You have two socks in a pair of socks. Two socks in a pair of socks. How many pants do you have in a pair of pants? One pair. Does that make any sense? Or a pair of scissors. How many scissors do you have when you have a pair of scissors? You have one pair. I mean, you have one scissor. How many cups do you have when you have a pair of cups? You have two cups. That's how goofy this is. The English language has to be the goofiest language on planet Earth. Few is more than two, less than all. I see. Thank you, Dozer533. And yes, I have received your email, so thank you. I will correspond back to you within 72 hours. Thank you for your viewership. Does anybody, I'll tell you, the, I'll tell this story and then I'll head out. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Colin David Eiffelman, Colin Miller, or his seminars, or the hundreds of hours of footage that are available to the public. Oh, well, some of it's been scrubbed. But in one of those videos, he tells a story about a guy that went into court. Uh, he was representing himself. He didn't have an attorney. And... I think it was a, something had to do with a traffic accident or something. And he told the judge, I know what happened because I have all the ed evidence. And the judge said, did you just say you had all the evidence? And the guy said, yeah, I have all the evidence. So the judge said, okay, well, I want you to gather all the evidence and bring it back here in a month. I expect to see you back here with all the evidence. You have to prove all. So that's when this guy reached out to David Wood Miller and said, oh man, I got myself in a pickle here because I told the judge I had all the evidence. How can I prove that I have all the evidence? And then David Wood Miller said, start practicing handstands. You have to be able to do a handstand on the spot in 30 days. So the guy started practicing doing handstands. And then in 30 days, when he went back into the court, the judge says, well, I'm waiting. I'd like you to see, show me all the evidence. So the guy did a handstand in the middle of the well of the court. And the judge said, what are you doing? And the guy said, my feet are dangling in a sea of space, and I'm holding all of the evidence on planet Earth. And the judge was like, can't argue with that. <laughs> oh, man, I can't tell that story the way David Wynn Miller can tell it. But I just thought that was funny. That's how you prove all. You got to do a handstand and hold planet Earth. To bring it back to the grammar, that is why... The word A-L-L, -L, number one, is non-tangible contract, and number two, would never, ever, ever be used in a correct sentence structure contract because you cannot prove all. You literally cannot prove all. As a lodial, I would use the word any in place of all any is not any is just as inclusive but it's not as restrictive all 
All right. Anybody else have any type of question about correct sentence structure, communication, policy, syntax, grammar? You're very welcome. Does anybody have any questions about claim of the live life, sea pass, sea treaty, fate rip, volition claim, uh, domicile claim, anything like that? I'd be happy to answer your questions. Or we can just catch them in the next one. Again, folks, you know, I've been in this uh, earthly domain for a little over 51 years. I'm not real tech savvy. I don't really know how TikTok works. Algorithms and so on and so forth. So doing the best I can here. My main channel is my YouTube channel. Much more confident with that platform. But I am trying to bring it here. And, and I got some good viewership over here. And I really appreciate I got a lot of gratitude for everybody watching this. To say it using correct sentence structure, I would say something like, for this claimant sensation of the cognition is, with the claimant's knowledge of the facts, with the claim of the gratitude, with the viewership of the TikTokers, with this sensation, by this claimant, comma, Jason Knife and Matthew Colin Glass, period. That's how I would say it in correct sentence structure. And to bring it back to the grammar, that's how well you have to know the grammar to be able to use it successfully under duress. You have to be able to create a correct sentence structure like that, off the top of your head. Not so much verbally, but written. I mean, you can speak it as I just did. You can speak it verbally, but it is a written grammar. That's where its power and potency lies, is in the writ of the grammar. How did judge evict me during COVID and the clerk deny me submission of a document? Well, without getting too much into it there, Ducky, I'm a quack. What are you doing when you're submitting a document to a court, a fiction court? What are you doing when you submit? What does a Muslim do when they submit to Allah? You're giving authority to someone else over you. You are consenting to a court having an authority over you. With correct sentence structure, you wouldn't do that. You're the authority with correct sentence structure. You wouldn't submit anything. You would never give another entity authority over yourself if you are the authority of yourself. Now, if you're not the authority of yourself, then, I mean, it's up to you. It's your choice to give authority to someone else. I'm trying to convey the psychology of correct sentence structure. You would never do that. You would never submit paperwork. You can go there and file it in as a peaceful and neutral live life claimant. But again, they can refuse you. It's their vessel. It's their terms and conditions. You can't force them to file it. You see what I'm saying? It's, and this stuff comes after you learn the grammar, actually, because it's hard to, I find that people, most people who don't know the grammar, find it very challenging to wrap their head around the psychological condition of state that one must have to use this grammar. It's hard to explain it because people are so used to the court system and the way it works, the fiction system. And correct sentence structure is not the same thing as that. You would never submit to them. It's against their rules to deny filing of any documents. Well, their rules are arbitrary. They can change them anytime they want to. They can break their own rules. What does it matter? They have the bigger guns and clubs. You and I are peons to them. We're nothing. But correct sentence structure gives us a position to where 
we are on a geometric level playing field. And then we invite people to come onto that geometric level playing field to participate with the facts. And 9.99999 times out of 10, they will not. And that's how correct sentence structure stops the trespass. That's when you get your case dismissed. That's when the court doesn't want anything to do with you anymore. They just want to get you out of their hair. They leave you alone. You might have to go through some trials and tribulations before that happens. Some growing pains. But they eventually leave you alone. Once you have closure on the grammar and you know what you're talking about and they know you know what you're talking about. They may not know what you're talking about, but they know you know. And that's scary for them. One thing they don't want is equality. The fiction court system is so skewed and unbalanced, it's not even funny. What correct sentence structure does is it brings balance. And they don't want anything to do with fairness or balance or justice. They just want this. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. This has been the best live stream yet. And uh, I appreciate everybody here that left comments, asked questions, shared their personal stories. Again, my main channel is YouTube, www.youtube.com forward slash Jason Matthew Glass. You can find an edited version of this live stream over there probably in the next week or so. And then I'll be back here again, hopefully in a couple more days with another live stream. Turn on your notifications and all that if you're interested. If you want to learn the grammar, email me, jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com. Use your full correct name and just say, hey, Jason, I saw you on TikTok. I'd like to apply for a workshop. Sup? Pull up. And uh, I'll get back to you within 72 hours. Thanks again, everybody. I'll see you soon. If you'd like to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, Contact me at the email address listed at the bottom of your screen. I will set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation between you and me. You can ask me whatever you like and I'll do the same and we'll see if this is something that you're prepared to commit to. If you'd like to support the channel, click on the join button underneath this video. There are two tiers of membership. Uh, the second tier has access to exclusive content not available to the public. Uh, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, turn the notification bell to all so that you don't miss any of my premieres because I do post on a very consistent basis. Thank you again and I'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.